What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living under a rock and seen this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another very interesting organized crime topic. And there is no family in the New York Mafia, as far as its history is concerned, that has had more strife, more war, and more deceit than the Colombo crime family. For years, wars have plagued this group, and they've been a disorganized mess for a lot of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. One of the more constant names is Tommy Schatz, Joelli. Joely really until the end avoided prison. He was involved in all sorts of rackets and had connections to the high ups in that family. The story of Tommy Schatz next on Sit Down Shorts. Thomas Joely was born October 15th, 1952, and that is synonymous. Today is Tommy Schatz's 71st birthday. So we say hello, we say, uh, Buona Fortuna uh, to Tommy Schatz Giuelli, which it just happened to be fate. Uh, i had be honest, I did not know that that was his birthday until today. Uh, so there you go. Happy birthday to Tommy Schatz. Now, Tommy Schatz would be born on Long Island. He was from the area of Farmingdale, not far from Queens and Brooklyn. So he was able to move around in the streets uh, and still live out on Long Island. Now, Long Island is very synonymous with the Colombo crime family. Growing up, uh, Tommy Schatz would be close with Jojo Russo. Now, Jojo Russo is the son of Andrew Mush Russo, a longtime member of the Colombo crime family, who, as we know, is cousins with Carmine Persco. Now, Mush Russo was in control for the most part of the rackets on Long Island. And that was very important to Tommy Schatz because throughout Tommy Schatz's life, he was very close with Mush Russo. And even into the 90s, when Mush Russo would go away, Tommy Schatz was integral in controlling some of the rackets and overseeing some things that Mush was in control of. Now, as a young individual, Tommy Schatz, Joelli, who it was argued really probably should have never become a gangster. If we look at his family, at least his parents, um, they had zero connection to the mafia. And that's something that we rarely see when we're discussing gangsters. Now, Tommy Schatz would again start palling around with Joe Jerusalem and they begin, began getting into the criminal game. Tommy Schatz would start hanging out in Brooklyn and Queens. Now, in 1976, per the New York State inmate locator, Tommy Schatz Joelli was arrested on a robbery pinch and would go to jail by the end of the 70s. He would be released in 1980. Upon his release, Tommy Schatz would go right back to the streets, and he would actually become an associate uh, of Chucky Russo. Now, Chucky Russo is the nephew of Mush Russo. Chucky Russo, by that point, uh, was an up-and-comer, and he would actually place Tommy Schatz under his tutelage. Now, for Tommy Schatz, he was becoming uh, an earner. He was becoming someone that could move around in the streets, had connections, he was a fast rising up and comer. And for any young up and comer in the late 70s, early 80s, the goal is to become a made man. You want to get your button. And the quickest way to get your button is by being involved in a murder. Now, this murder, really, there's a lot of differ, differing opinions as to what would happen. Now, before I talk about this murder, a lot, a lot, a lot of the evidence would come from the police. However, there are evidence and there is testimony from this individual, Salvatore Big Sal Michiata. Now, Michiata was a me member of the Colombo crime family, and he was uh, actually involved with the murder that I'm about to talk about that Tommy Schatz allegedly was at. Around this time in the early 80s, the mafia is very involved with porn, the film industry, and merging the two together. As we know, I've discussed different members of the mafia that were involved in porn, Michael Zeffirano, Di Bernardo, other people like that. But one of the Colombo crime families, people that was involved in porn, specifically was Joseph 
Perano Sr. Now, Perano's uh, family had been involved with pornographic videos for years. And in fact, at one point, the federal government and the Daily News in New York would actually identify Perano as a top 50 porn production manufacturer in New York and around the country. So these guys were very involved. Now, around that time, the movie Deep Throat was in production. And as we know, Sonny Franzese was involved with that, as well as Joe Pirano. Joe Pirano actually acted as one of the chief financiers of the film. Now, as we know, Carmine Persco was a greedy psychopath who believed everyone was out to get him. By this point, Persico believed that Pirano was skimming off the top, him and his brother, of that Deep Throat uh film now as we know with deep throat uh, it would make a lot of money uh, and the colombo crime family wanted their piece joe pirano was marked as a man that needed to be offed by the colombo crime family according to carmine persico now the chief shooter allegedly that day was big sal michiata and we would find that out because big sal michiata would become a cooperator down the road. Now, it is important to understand, it has been widely talked about that Sal Michiata allegedly hated Thomas Jueli. So again, what I'm about to talk about, it is questioned. Now, we will learn that Tom Jueli was actually supposedly a crash car in that shooting that day. They would target and set a meeting with Joe Pirano in the area of Lake Street off Avenue W, in Gravesend in Brooklyn. That day, a team of shooters was dispatched. Joe Pirano would actually be shot in the buttocks. Joe Pirano's son, Joe Jr., would die that day. Now, as the shooting happens, Joe Pirano is around the area of his brother's home, Louis Pirano. Now, Louis Pirano actually married a woman called Veronica Zarao. Zarao was a former nun from Brazil, and she had become very involved in the Italian community actually at one point was a social worker. She was in her kitchen in this area. At that point, Perano stumbles up towards the steps of this home. Sadly, that day, Ms. Zarao caught a bullet and died. She caught a stray from shotgun blast and died that day. And this was a major problem for the mafia. In tune and trying to kill Joe Perano and certain members of that family, a ardent blast hit Ms. Arau and killed her. She was an innocent person killed by members of the mafia. Now, according to Big Sal Michiata, who, again, we could argue we don't know that we exactly believe his testimony. I'm just putting out what he said. According to after the fact that this woman was killed, the Colombo crime family was under the microscope. And Michiata would say at one point that Tommy shot Jueli in being involved with this murder was, quote, very unnerved about it. And at one point would tell associates, quote, he was going to go to hell for killing a nun. So, again, this was an innocent woman. Members of the mafia take this stuff seriously. And in turn, in cases where people are killed that are not close to the mafia or not belonging to the mafia, certain members take it seriously. If we know anything about Tommy Schatz, we would find out throughout his life he was a very religious individual. According to people that knew him, he would go to church. Now, again, was that just his own baggage and him trying to cover up for the fact that he was a criminal and a killer? I'm not exactly sure. But again, from what Michiata says, he definitely took it seriously. Now, we could also make it a point that Michiata did not like uh, Mr. Uh, Gioelli. Now, it's important to say that the lawyers for Tommy Schatz would say that Michiata hated Tommy and that uh, there should be no charges and he was never involved with this murder. But interestingly enough, in 1987, several years later, uh, Tommy Schatz would actually become a made member of the Colombo crime family, according to lcnblogspot.com, which is a great uh, website, I might add. Uh, they would say that he would be inducted on January 9th, 1987, alongside another Colombo individual, Teddy Persico Jr. Both those individuals would be made that day. Now, around this time, once Tommy Schatz gets made, he starts assembling a crew around him. And we discussed that in a video up here on Dino Calabra. One of the people that Tommy Schatz becomes very close to is a young hood from Brooklyn called Dino Calabro. Calabro was a Sicilian who was from Brooklyn in the area of Bensonhurst. He begins getting a bit of a reputation as a car, a thief, and a burglar. Uh, he starts hanging out with another individual 
Tommy McLaughlin. Now, Tommy McLaughlin was half Irish, half Italian, and was actually the cousin of Tommy Schatz. Tommy Schatz takes both Calabro and McLaughlin alongside an individual called Richard Graves under his wing. And what he begins to learn is they're a very profitable group. They're making a lot of money through bank robberies, holdups, uh, all sorts of different violent crimes. They're making a lot of money. Anything they can get their hands on, the Dino Calabro crew is stealing. This would form a crew called the Bay Parkway Boys, which I'm sure many of you have heard. That would be headquartered at 75th Street and 20th Avenue in Benson. That's where these guys would hang out. And they would, again, be a farm team that would war with other groups, according uh, to many people like the Bath Avenue crew, which I actually talked about in that video that I uh, mentioned. Now, what Tommy Schatz would get is a lot of the halls. They would kick up to him. He would then in turn kick up to his superiors. Now, what Tommy Schatz was allegedly doing was taking all the money and making himself a very rich man through loan sharking and Joker poker machines. It was talked about that Tommy Schatz Joker poker machines was incredibly lucrative. And what he would basically do is he would go into a bar on Long Island or wherever and basically, hey, look, you don't have a Joker poker machine. Let's give you one or two. We'll give you a 50-50 split. I get 50%. You get 50%. I deal with the maintenance on these machines. I'll come deal with them. All you got to do is sit them in your bar and you get 50%. It's a win-win for a bar. Go to any bar on the East Coast, seemingly, Northeast. There's a Joker poker machine in it. Now, think of it like this. Let's just say Tommy Schatz has 500 machines and they're only making $100 a week for 52 weeks a year. Think of just $100. Now, they're probably making more than that. Think of the amount of money you can make each year off Joker Poker Machines. It's a big business. There's a lot of money in that. And Tommy Schatz was taking the money he was making from this crew underneath him and making himself a rich man and kicking up and becoming a very trusted member of the Colombo crime family. Tommy Schatz was a made man. He had a group under him. Things were going well. Now, it would be talked about that Tommy Schatz would occasionally even participate with the crew in their robberies. At one point in 1991, Tommy Schatz, alongside Dino Calabro and another individual called Little Dino Saracino, would actually, or actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't Little Dino. It was Joey Cave's copy of Teller, who was a number other member. Joey Cave's Dino and Tommy Schatz would actually pose as father and sons. They would go into a high-end fur store with the hopes of buying a fur coat. In that point, they would actually stick up the robbery, uh, stick it up with a robbery and make off with about 150 furs. Now, the 150 furs that they stole were valued high six figures. And it was alleged that after they did that score, Dino Calabro would actually get married uh, subsequently right after. Now, as I said, they were committing robberies. Tommy Schatz had the loan sharking and Joker poker. He was also approving murders. And as we know, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about a, a lot of that in the Dino Calabro video, so I'm not going to go through it. They would become involved, the Bay Parkway boys, in an altercation with members of the Bath Avenue crew. And as I said, you can check out the video up here to hear more about the Dino story. But I want to really keep this to Tommy Schatz. Around this time, though, Tommy Schatz would start to have to deal with some issues with certain people uh, that he has underneath him, most notably his cousin, Tommy McLaughlin. By this point, it had become very well known that in Brooklyn, Tommy McLaughlin was very close with his cousin, Tommy Schatz, but he had also done work at one point for feared Colombo Kappa regime, Greg Scarpa. And Greg Scarpa believed that he kind of had uh, some claim to Tommy McLaughlin as well. Think of it kind of like the Donnie Brasco situation. Anthony Mira believed that Donnie Brasco was his. Lefty Ruggieri also believed the same. So basically, Tommy Schatz and Greg Scarpa are going kind of back and forth. They want Tommy Schatz, or they want Tommy McLaughlin under them. Now, Tommy Schatz uh, really didn't have much of a case because by this point, Tommy McLaughlin was actually dating the daughter of Greg Scarpa, little Linda Scarpa. So there was a big problem. And obviously he had a love life. Uh, we know young love. You always want to be with those people. So Tommy McLaughlin really kind of wanted to be under Greg Scarpa. A sit down would happen uh, and it would be presided over by the acting boss of the family at the time, Joe Tomasello. Now Tomasello was a former Brooklyn capo who 
kind of got the acting boss title for a year or two. He would, according to Larry Mazza, one of uh, Scarpa's uh, confidants, he would basically rule in favor of Scarpa, and Tommy McLaughlin would be placed under the tutelage of Greg Scarpa. And according to Mazza, they actually didn't think much of Tommy Schatz, according to Mazza. Now, we would obviously find out that Tommy Schatz was a pretty formidable individual in his own right, but according to the feared uh, Whippy Boys crew, they didn't think much of Tommy Shots. Now, during the career of Tommy Shots, when he was first made and into the 90s, he would actually come under the tutelage of Joseph Jojo Russo, his former friend, um, and other crew members of that crew would include uh, Joseph Senior Lollipops Kana, Nikki Rizzo, and Tommy Shots. Now, during this time, as we know, the Arena Persico War is ratcheting up. Carmine Persico. Vic Arena. And, you know, certain crew members start either going with the Arena crew or going with the Persico crew, Persico crew. And what would happen is the Jojo Russo crew would start to splinter. Certain people went with the Arena group. Certain people went with the Persico group. Now, during this time, obviously very little to the Mush Persico faction. Tommy Schott sides with that group. But there were certain members that did not side with them, as well as there were other capos in the family that were placed on a hit list. Uh, the hit list that we would find that Tommy Schatz and his crew were out looking for would happen to be there were certain members that were on the arena side. They would include Ridgewood Queens capo, Fat Patty Catalano, Staten Island capo, Joe Amato, and Brooklyn capo, Wild Bill Cotola. They were all on the hit list for Tommy Schatz and the Persico group. One of the other individuals that was on the hit list was the former crew member, uh, John Minerva. Minerva at one point was part of Jojo Russo and the Persico side, but he switches over. He is a marked man. And as we know, uh, Dino Calabro actually would be involved in the hit on John Minerva on Long Island. It was also said that Tommy Schatz was directly involved as well. Obviously, eventually, the arena Persco war would end. I'm not going to go through all that. That's for another video, probably at some point. But Tommy Schatz would get his call by 1994. Jojo Russo would be sent to prison. And Tommy Schatz would take over the old Jojo Russo crew. And, you know, again, around this time, Tommy Schatz has a pretty good reputation. He's known as a shooter. He's known as an earner. And he's known as being very connected. The war would end, he takes over. Now, in his crew, it would include people like Dino Calabro, Nicky Rizzo. Now, I will say Nicky Rizzo, and not a lot of people know about Nicky Rizzo, he was a huge earner, had a huge loan book, very frugal individual, had a lot of money. He was kicking up to uh, the crews, and uh, other people in the crew included Ralph Scopo Jr., and Joe Monteleone. This was also a very important time for Tommy Schatz because around this time as well, Bush Russo is in prison. And as we know, as I said earlier, Tommy Schatz was very involved with really kind of running the family through uh, other capos. There was kind of a ruling body at this point, the Colombo crime family. And Tommy Schatz was handling a lot of the day-to-day -day operations of what Bush Russo was doing, things like garbage, things of that nature. And According to Bonanno Turncoat Sal Vitale, he would say at one point that Schatz was constantly in meetings representing the Colombo crime family during disputes. So he was by this point, Tommy Schatz, a pretty high up individual. The problem was by this point, uh, Tommy Schatz was going to have to start dealing with something that would really kind of change his life in a way forever. Uh, around this time, as we know, in 1996, uh, Joe Waverly Cacase is obviously a very high up individual in the family. Many people believe by this point he was kind of the real boss of the family. He becomes embroiled in a problem with his former wife, a woman called Kim Kenna. And I talked about that in a Joe Waverly video seen here. He wants an individual called Ralph Doles killed. Now, he would tell Tommy Schatz Gioelli, uh, Joe Waverly, that uh, this Doles guy was just a Mexican from a social club that had disrespected him. Nobody thought anything of it. Tommy Schatz would go to his chief assassin, Dino Calabro, and basically say, hey, look, you need to kill this Mexican guy, Ralph Doles. Now, no one was told that Doles was actually a police officer. Now, Calabro would talk about at one point that 
it took a while to kill Doles because they couldn't find him. And at one point, Tommy Schatz basically told Calabra that, hey, if he couldn't get the job done, he would have somebody else do it. Uh, Calabro basically said, look, we'll get it done. In August of 1997, Ralph Doles would be shot in front of his home after he finished a shift as a police officer. Now, I want to talk about what subsequently would happen. Dino Calabro was furious. He would find out the day later that Doles was actually a police officer. He would go directly to Tommy Schott's home in Farmingdale, Long Island. Calabro would testify that basically he went to Tommy Schott's furious and that Tommy Schott's, the secretive guy that he was, said, quiet, you know, talking code, that sort of thing. They went outside and started talking. And at one point, Dino Calabro actually floated the idea of killing Joe Waverly for this decision. Um, but ultimately, that would never happen. Look, you could say what you want about Dino Calabro, but he, like his predecessor, Tommy Schatz, they both believed that we don't kill police, we don't kill women, we don't kill people that don't belong to this life. And this was clear throughout Tommy Schatz's life that he had a real problem with some of this stuff. The problem was Joe Waverly was above him. And when Joe Waverly tells you to do something, you do it. He didn't do much reconnaissance about who Doles actually was. And him and Dino would have to really kind of face uh, the letter of the law, which would come down on them, you know, for years. They were constantly under FBI supervision. For Tommy Schatz, though, he continued to remain on the streets. And around this time, as we know, there's new leadership in the Colombo crime family. The members of the family, at least the upper echelon, is dwindling. Joe Waverly, Mush Russo, all these different guys are behind the wall. And by this point, basically the Colombo crime family is working as far as leadership through a group of captains, most notably Tommy Schatz. Eventually, though, certain leadership would kind of figure itself out. Ali Boy Persico would actually make Wild Bill Cotolo the underboss. At one point, a member of the DeKalvin Canty crime family would talk about the fact that at that point when Bill Cotolo becomes underboss, he's strutting around. Basically, it's become clear that he's going to try to make a play on boss. And one thing we know, whether it's Carmen Persico, Little Ali Boy Persico, it really doesn't matter. They never want to relinquish control. So the order comes down while Bill needs to go. Now, Dino Calabro would say, he would mention that at one point he would be summoned to a Catholic church where Tommy Schatz was there, quote, praying. He was basically ordered at that point to kill Wild Bill. That was going to happen. That was going to be figured out. Everything was going to work. The plan was, as we've talked about in the Bill Catola video, which I've done as well, Cotolo was summoned to the home of little Dino Saracino in Brooklyn. Now, Dino Calabro would testify what happened that day. He said he walked out to meet Cotolo in the driveway. He said, quote, we shook hands. Cotolo would say, Ali's here, right? Where are we going? He would walk in in front of Calabro in Saracino's home. Calabro would walk in and say, I followed him, pulled out my gun, and shot him in the head. He just went, whoa, and fell backwards into a closet. That would be the last time we would see Wild Bill Cotolo. It was a big piece of work. Again, Tommy Schatz directly involved in this. He's, in a way, the co-conspirator. And it was said that day, Tommy Schatz was there as well. That he would have to face that down the road. Uh, but again, Tommy Schatz still on the street. He continues to try to maintain order over a very dwindling leadership chart. And it's funny because around the early 2000s, uh, another member of the Colombo crime family would be placed kind of right below uh, Tommy Schatz, uh, Sonny Franzis, who by this point was in his late 80s. In fact, at one point in a jailhouse conversation, Vincent Vinny Basciano, uh, the Bonanno family boss, would actually talk about this at one point behind bars. Uh, they would talk about the fact that they were blown away, uh, Bashiana, that Franzese um, was the underboss and that he wouldn't be long before he ended up back in bars. Bashiana would say, quote, he's in some shape, Bo. He might live to be 100, uh, which he obviously would, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting caveat. So, you know, at this point, Tommy Schatz is basically calling the shots in the Colombo crime family. But this wouldn't last long. We would find out that by the mid-2000s, Tommy Schatz would have to face uh, a jury finally. Uh, it wouldn't stop him, though, from continuing to run his operation on the streets. He was still making a lot of money, but things were starting to dwindle. 
Extortion's not as easy to do by this point. Loan sharking's not as easy to do. But he's still shaking down strip clubs, uh, nightclubs, including one club called Mirage, which is out on Westbury in Long Island. It was said that he was very connected in that club and was actually making a lot of money through extortion. At one point, it was also alleged that Tommy Schatz ordered Dino Calabro to give a beating to this individual. Johnny Goomba, Goomba Johnny, who was a radio DJ. Allegedly, he said something to one of uh, Gioelli's daughters, and Gioelli was was hot about it and ordered Goomba Johnny to be beaten up. Um, Now, again, Goomba Johnny's still around, but it is just a funny kind of part of this whole thing. It would all come undone, though, for Tommy Schatz in 2008. In fact, Judgment Day would be on June 4th, 2008, according to the ColumboMafia.com. He's involved in a 17-count indictment, which was unsealed on multiple members of the Colombo crime family. Tommy Schatz will be charged with the 1992 murder of John Minerva and also Michael Imbargamo. And he was also be implicated in the murder of Frank Chestnut Marasa, who at that point was part of of the Bath Avenue crew. So Tommy Schatz had a lot of charges here and this would really threaten him really for the rest of his life, as far as being ever on the street again. Um, For Tommy Schatz, things, the writing was on the wall. He would actually ultimately as well uh, be indicted in 2010 for the Ralph Doles murder, uh, as well at one point for the Bill Cotolo murder. In 2012 though, a jury would return a mixed verdict and he would be cleared of the Catolo and Dole's murder, but would be convicted of conspiracy to commit murder in the uh, Frank Minerva and or the John Minerva and Frank Marasa cases. The problem for Tommy Schatz was his old friend Dino Calabro and other members of the Colombo crime family would flip against him. Tommy Schatz was old school. He wasn't going away without a fight, but he was also going away without talking. Tommy Schatz was never going to talk. Ultimately, for Tommy Schatz in 2014, he would be sentenced to 18 years plus in prison in order to pay about $400,000 in restitution. To this day, Tommy Schatz is still in prison and he's scheduled for release in mid-2023. Now, it wouldn't have stopped Tommy Schatz. Tommy Schatz at one point in 2021 would actually file for compassionate release Uh, from federal prison due to the coronavirus. Tommy Schatz has cancer. He has diabetes. And this wouldn't be the first time he would actually file for compassionate release. According to a New York Daily News article, at one point, he would actually file allegedly for uh, compassionate release a couple different times, which would uh, have a uh, Daily News uh, writer rip into him at one point in 2010, alleging that Jueli was a, quote, fat fella and junk food junkie. In the Daily News, according to the commissary reports and citing court documents in 2009, Joelli was uh, his commissary list would include Cajun hot snacks, donut sticks, Hershey bars, honey nut scooters, Pringles, onion chips, rich crackers, a Snickers bar, three pouches of spam lunch meat, six packets of tuna, five turkey and Swiss sticks, as well as six packages of Velveeta macaroni and cheese. They would claim the government that you can't complain that your diet isn't up to par when this is what you're ordering from the prison commissary. They would shoot down his uh, request for bail and other stuff, and then ultimately his compassionate release stuff as well. He continues to sit behind the wall, Tommy Schatz. As I said, he is in his early 70s, and as long as he doesn't die, we'll get out at some point. The question we always have with all these gangsters that eventually get out of prison, like a Joe Watts or a Gene Gotti or a Tommy Schatz Gioelli, is what do they do once they get out? It's clear that Tommy Schatz has spent the last decade plus in prison. But one thing we've learned about people like him or Mush Russo is they never quite get away from the streets. We've seen one of his counterparts, Joe Waverly, recently get out. These guys are who they are. They're not going to go just get a job at a snack shop or a golf course or or something like that bagging groceries. They're just not going to do it. It's likely that once Tommy Schatz gets out, they'll probably head right back to the streets. The end for him is pretty simple. He will likely die in federal prison or sick in his own bed, giving up years to the government. 
As always, I apologize for the long video, but I wanted to make sure I included a lot of info. At the end of the day, Tommy Schatz is a stone cold gangster and definitely was very connected in the Colombo crime family. As always, make sure you hit the like button and make sure you subscribe. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.